everybody. Um, uh, my name is Christian Megel, uh, founder of VentureLane and co-founder of VentureLane Studio, um, the studio and accelerator that is traction-oriented and sales-oriented that we just launched last week. So that is the very first time, actually, that we're doing Fastlane during the aura, uh, era of, of the studio. Uh, what we're doing in the last three years, uh, really focusing on B2B um, early stage tech startups, the founders, the teams, help them along. Um, we have a space here in downtown Boston, but we do a lot of community events and social events and, and workshops like, like this one to help founders out, reach out to, to everybody and hopefully help to understand a couple things better and put the puzzle pieces, puzzle pieces together. Fastlane is our series where we uh, once a month uh, have invite uh, a general partner from a big uh, VC or a, a known VC, most likely early stage uh, um, focused um, VC fund. And today we're we're really blessed to have uh, Anna here um, from from Flybridge. Anna, how how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Like Back my first office. my first time. question would be, did you get enough sleep tonight? <laughs> I did. Yes, I did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we were, tonight, so. Since we were just talking about about uh, about about kids, uh, Anna, um, I just mentioned before. So today's uh, topic is uh, bubble or no bubble, founders pitfalls, uh, and you know, really listening to both sides. And I'll do a bit of Q and A in the first 25, 30 minutes. Please be not shy to actually use uh, the chat to put your LinkedIn profile in, or or uh, your name, or do an introduction if you want to uh, if you want to connect with the other people that are on this call. Uh, and the other one is don't be shy with questions. So put them right down here in uh, in the Q and A's so that Anne and I can get to this. Uh, a little later in the in the session, so uh, bring it all on. It's a timely uh, it's a timely uh, webinar around. Uh, is this a bubble? Is it not a bubble? How do I go about valuations? And how do I how do I go about this? And how do I read the latest uh, the latest uh, movements? For example, on the stock markets and everything else. So and I see already here a couple of first ones that are that are chiming in and putting in their their uh, LinkedIn profile. Anna, so tell us a little bit about about yourself. I want to hear a little bit about your founder background, but also what brought you to Flybridge and wanting to be a VC. Yeah. Um, so I am a Boston-based founder initially. So I started my first company. Back in 2012, went through, as we were talking about, the Boston Techstars program that really started me on the path of entrepreneurship and venture capital. Um, that company was the, well, the industry leader in high-end clothing donations. So anything that was a little nicer in your closet than what you give to Goodwill or Salvation Army, we made it really easy for you to donate it. We'd intake it, process it, list it on the site, and you could choose any 501c3 to give the proceeds back to. Um, Ended up selling that one in 2016. Then uh, I was having a conversation with actually Chip Hazard from Flybridge about just how few women there were on the other side of the table. We had raised from I think, close to 60 people on the cap table and there was one female investor. And so that initially piqued my interest in the venture side of just thinking through the amazing women that I knew that were starting companies. There needed to be more capital for them and there needed to be more representation. And so launched X Factor Ventures in partnership with Flybridge four and a half, almost five years ago now, which was a seed stage focused fund, which now has done 74, 75 investments in the female founded company. Wow. Nice. Um, yeah, we're 2.2% of the total investments that have gone to female founders in the last oh. five years, which is just mind blowing. Um, that needs to, <laughs> needs to be changed. I know. That needs to be changed. It really, it really does. Um, but that got my, my feet wet on the investing side, but I still had the entrepreneurial bug. I think as a lot of people probably here can recognize once you're an entrepreneur, it's really hard to shake that. It's a part of who you are. And so started another company, um, called Doe, which is a marketplace to connect women who are making amazing products with consumers. Um, and then we actually just sold that and announced it last week, which is exciting. Um, uh, but I had stepped away to do investing full time. A little over a year ago, last October, to join Flybridge as a GP. 
Nice, awesome, yeah. good stuff. Yeah, thanks for and that that is uh, so two times founder, so that you have like in depth knowledge what it means to sit on the other side of the table, and I love that you bring actually that experience uh, to the to the VC world. Now, tell us a little bit about Flybridge. Um, what you know? How big is the fund? Uh, what what is the thesis? What kind of check sizes usually see? And maybe give us a couple of examples of companies that you invested in. Yeah. Um, so Flybridge, we are pre-seed, seed, and will be some opportunistic A's. Um, our fund size is a little over 100 million. Um, our average check size is anywhere between, you know, we'll do super early pre-seed bets of 250, 300K, all the way through leading or co-leading an institutional seed round with you know, $2 million or more checks. Um, as a firm, we're pretty open in general as far as what we like. Uh, we've done 25 investments last year. 15 of those were SaaS companies, actually. So this is very relevant for us. Uh, and then as a partnership, I think one of the cool things about Flybridge is that there's four of us that are partners and you really have access to all of us. So if you're a Flybridge portfolio company, not only do you get to work with your partner, but you're working across everyone in the firm. And then we also have a much broader network of founders and about 50 or so um, investing expertise and partners that are part of our network funds as well. Yeah. Do you have, do you, can you give us uh, some examples of companies that you invested in lately or some of your biggest successes? Yeah. Um, so probably most interesting on the success side, we were super early backers of MongoDB, uh, which as awesome. far as yeah. like just watching a rocket ship be burst before your eyes. How cool is like, that? <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. Um, Chip, one of my partners, is still on the board there. And so very well versed in you know, anything cloud, developer tools, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, on the personal side, so my recent investment is an interesting kind of SaaS marketplace hybrid company called Floorfrown that powers circular commerce for furniture. So if you have a couch that you want to return, everyone knows it's super annoying. Floorfrown makes that process seamless and easy, and then they intake it and then allow the retailer to relist that on the site as an open box item, and they power all of the software and the people behind making that happen. Would you say, is there anything that you're excluding from your investment thesis, like uh, you're not doing B2C or you're not doing life sciences or uh, hardware? Um, we don't do life sciences, like anything in the biotech world we don't do. Um, healthcare will do, like healthcare... SaaS or any any technology enablement of healthcare, but we don't really do like medical devices and that sort of thing. Okay, um, thank you, thank you so much for for going into this. Uh, uh, provides a really great framework for everybody to gauge where 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 Flybridge uh, is and, and positions itself. Now, uh, Anna, we had a bit of a chat this morning, and uh, you shared uh, some experiences that you had with your with your first uh, startup, The Fashion Project. You were a first-time founder. And this is, I think, relevant because it, it I, I, I love that experience because it's, it's probably a predicament or a situation that founders are very often in, all of our first-time founders, like how to deal with fundraising and what how does it play out in the end because it, it it feels like it's a big puzzle piece but the puzzle piece or the puzzle in overall changes all the time so can you tell us a little bit of what you learned in terms of fundraising picking the right investors the right size we're going to talk a little bit about bubble later on and valuations and too high too low too early too late any anything that you that you want to share from from the fashion project so many learnings from that. Um, so I think one of the ones that we were talking about earlier to the point on valuation is that we had taken in a large amount of money on notes. So we kept stacking the notes up against each other. So it was the Techstars note, then we did, um, I think, 1.8 million or so in notes, and a step up valuation. We did another like three or so million. Then after that, on another note, that was a much higher valuation. and. Um, as a founder, I don't think I ever realized the impact of when you have all of those then convert and compound on top of each other, what that meant for our valuation going into the A, and that by the time we got all the way through that, uh, we had raised a fair amount of money on notes, and we went to do the price round and realized that that price was going to be so far outside of what the market would pay for the company that 
um, we were a little bit at the mercy of our investors of granting us back equity in the company because we had sold too much as founders. And so one of the big lessons that I take away from that is being very on top of your cap table. And if you're thinking about raising, especially on safes or notes, I think the, the process is really easy on the front end, but sometimes I think it's maybe more beneficial on the back end to be thinking about price rounds slightly earlier on, or at least you know be on top of that and know how much you've sold. So I think that was a big lesson for me. Um, I'd also say on the fundraising side, I initially thought more was better. So I wanted as many investors on the cap table as possible because you know, I wanted lots of people involved in the company. And I realized over time that was pretty hard to manage. And so one of my other early takeaways is really being thoughtful about who are the partners you want along the way and making sure that you're optimizing your time and thinking about constructing your investor pool in a way that is going to make you as a founder as successful as possible without having to have, you know, 60 one-on-one conversations or whatever that happens to be. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you a little bit about your valuation. So what you said is like you stacked like a bunch of, a bunch of notes um, at the convertible notes, I guess um, at the, at the beginning. And then, and then, then you wanted to raise raise around, and that led to uh, like a massive, probably post money valuation, right? What kind of problems specifically did you did you see? Was that did this turn a bunch of people off? Um, it didn't. So it didn't turn people off because from an investor side, if they were coming in and pricing the round, I mean they could price it then at what they thought was fair, and it actually meant that they could control how much ownership to some degree they wanted. I think where it where it really hurt for me as a founder was I then was at a position where I had to rely on whoever the lead was to say, mm, like, we're not comfortable with you having only 10% of the company at this point in time. You really need to have you know, 20, and so we'll give you that. But um, I was really, I mean, it was at the mercy of whatever they were willing to, to do and what I could get in the market. Um, and market dynamics have shifted a little bit. There are a couple of articles that have come out that said basically like death to the secondhand industry, which is also not great when you're fundraising. Um, and so it was a little bit of a tough market condition, but I think that was challenging. And then it also meant for my early investors, like some of those caps had to be changed and we had to reconstruct the round. It was pretty hard conversations. Um, and so... It was just a lot of time, a lot of overhead, and I think a lot of relational stress that could have been avoided had we just priced early. What what's the what's the one or two learnings that you would like give back to any founder when it comes to that? Um, ensure that your lawyer, finance person, or you runs your cap table in all of these different scenarios, so you know before you take in more money on a note what that means. Um, I also think it's particularly relevant in this market when you're looking at safes, that if you can raise on a safe with a cap, that's great if you can ultimately hit that cap. But if the market conditions change or something, um, if you're not pricing, then that does give you some downside risk. And so my advice would just be pay attention and know your options and ask a lot of questions and um, just make sure that you know what the implications are downstream. Yeah, yeah. So just with the corrections that we saw on on Wall Street uh, this week, I mean, you know, more or less it's been going on. The corrections have been going on for the whole year already, or or even started even earlier. Like bubble, no bubble. I think we're having we're. I think that just the fact that we're discussing the word bubble again, like it shows you some some of the sentiment. Could you give us like what are the what kind of changes did you see over the last two two years in terms of valuations, uh, companies, the big trends out here that maybe led us to where we are right now? And, and then I'll talk a little bit later of like what do you think that means for for the companies? But like if you if you resonate uh, with the, just the last two years, what do you think has happened here in terms of fundraising, funding, VC? Uh, uh, companies uh, raising funds and, and startups raising? What what has changed and what is different? Uh, so I think there's a couple of big shifts. So first I would say just the speed at which deals are getting done, which I think is somewhat driven by Zoom, actually, that founders now can have you know, 
seven, eight investor meetings a day if they choose to. So you're seeing acceleration in the fundraising process. Um, there's also this trend of having much larger funds coming down market. So as you're seeing Tiger now investing in A's and driving up valuations, all of a sudden um, you know, those rounds and the construction of those rounds are looking slightly different. Um, and then, I mean, you pointed this out, but just valuations as a whole, I think has, they've all shifted much, much bigger, much later. And so I think what used to be called a seed round, now you're seeing people raising easily between two and $5 million seed rounds, and you're going out for your A's and raising you know, 20 or $30 million A's. And so everything is just stacks bigger um, and those rounds have now gotten bigger and earlier. And can I, can I ask you, like, just to put a couple of numbers, I think this is always mind-boggling. Like, I think back at that maybe three, four years ago, a SaaS company would, like, the, on, the, on the lower side, be on a six, six to eight times ARR, and then maybe that stretched a little bit into eight to 12 times ARR. What have you seen in the last couple of months in terms of multiples? Uh, I mean, we've seen all the way up to 50x, which is yeah. mind-boggling to me, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And to your point, I think on not just multiples, but valuation, I mean, I remember when we were raising our seed round, which just is coming out of Techstars, considered, you know, we were the hottest startup in New England, so uh, we were really a credentialed company, and we had maybe like a $12 million valuation, eight or 12, something like that, and now we're seeing companies coming out with 20 pretty consistently. Um, so anytime that you're messaging your partners because you see a company that has a $12 million valuation and no revenue and you're like, hey guys, this is a great deal. I think that's a sign that uh, that market shifts have happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think our title says bubble or no bubble. What's your take on that? My take is it's complicated because <laughs> I think there's, there obviously is some level of inflation and hype and things that are happening right now, but I think the, the underlying fundamentals of what's driving this are actually pretty solid. So I think part of what you're seeing, especially on the SaaS side, is you're seeing this incredible acceleration of growth of revenue and size of market. So when previously we were thinking about, could this company be a billion dollar company? Now you're saying not only can that company reach a billion dollar valuation very quickly and grow their revenue to that, um, but now you can expand you know, through the cloud, you can expand internationally, you're seeing just this market expansion overall. And so valuations are getting bigger, but the actual revenue and market dynamics underneath those are also getting larger. And so I think my answer to the bubble would be, it's a little bit dependent on sector, it's a little dependent on company, but there are, so there are instances I think where it's hyped and overvalued, but I actually think there's some core business fundamentals that are driving some of that upside and growth. Okay. And, you know, to be to be fair, the last two years have been the most successful in terms of exits and the VC uh, industry as such, like the returns. And I remember times in 2012 uh, where people said, oh my God, the valuations that everybody's paying is crazy. You know, you will never get your money back. And now, like, that has been... Uh, blown out of the water, uh, all the expectations. So, yeah, but it's it's a cyclical business, right? So, we need to be sure we had not too many uh, IPOs uh, coming out uh, before those last two years. So, uh, and Specs did probably their 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 bit here. So, um, what are you looking for, Anna? Like, what is a? Uh, I mean, we're. You know, we've been we've been doing fast, and a lot of we, we talk with a lot of a lot of um, people from the VC industry. How do you strike the balance? Like, how do you how do you strike the balance of? Uh, of course, you want a high valuation in a way, but, but well, maybe let's let's talk about this. What are the merits and what are the disadvantages of having, or maybe the expectations that come with a high valuation? Let's say I'm really set to. Take you know want to get the highest valuation. What from your ex experience as a founder, but also as a as a as somebody who invests and as an investor, like what what comes with that? Um, I think there's a large amount of pressure that comes with that. So if you think about every round that you're taking in, those dollars are essentially the thing that gets you to whatever the next stair step is of valuation, and so. 
if you're starting from a much higher stepping zone, then you're also going to have to leap much, much higher to then get to the next one. And so if you're coming in and you're saying, all right, I can get, you know, $50 million valuation, maybe that's 30x my revenue right now. When you go out to have to raise that next round, then investors are going to be probably more analytical as you get further and further. Um, they're going to look at those underlying revenue numbers and say, mm, like, yes, you raised that you know, 50 last time, but your revenue is really only, you know, maybe validating 40 or maybe it's only you can get to 60 or whatever that is. I think the, the pressure there is if you're going to raise at that valuation, you have to be incredibly mindful of how much cash you need to get to you whatever the next big round is that you want to do. So if that's, you want to go from 50 to 200, great, but you're going to have to take in so much more cash. Um, and so I think I would be incredibly mindful of that. So not just, not just top line number, but how much are you taking in on that? And can that truly get you to what you need for the next round? The feedback that I only always got, and like, please, please chime in here is like, you take a, you take a high round, high valuation, like you need to deliver for the follow-on. It's it's not necessarily whether you're able to get the, the high valuation right now, right here. It is like, can you deliver on a con continuous basis? What in your what in your experience, what happens to, to the companies that take a high valuation and, and possibly can't live up to the expectations comes with the next round? Um, they have a very hard time raising capital. And ultimately, if they do raise, they're raising at potentially a down round, which means you know, that is bad for previous investors, change relationships, change ownership, but also is really tough for the founder. It means you're getting diluted much, much more than if you ever would have just taken a you know, nice stair step, but maybe not that sky high valuation before. So I think the, and it puts the company actually in more risk that maybe you're not going to be able to make it depending on when that round and timing happens. So I think that if you can avoid that at all costs, that's, one of the, the death kills is both founders and companies. Um, so it's, it's vitally important, I think, to know what that next round is going to look like and what those metrics are going to need to be. So, so how do I strike the right balance here? So how do I find out as a founder, it's like, okay, um, you know, I need to place my round. I'm, maybe I'm doing pre-seed, I, maybe I do a seed. What do you think is, is okay? And how do you create a win-win situation? Because obviously, you know, you don't want to overdo it, but on the other hand, you don't want to uh, leave money on the table, right? So, um, yeah. In an understandable way. Um, I think a lot of that goes to just knowing your business. So if you're super on top of who your customers are, what your sales funnels are going to look like, how much you actually need to get to that next level. To your point, when you were talking about the mechanics of the business and not just the fundraising and pouring gas on the tank, um, if you know all of those things, then that gives you, I think, a pretty high degree of confidence that you know, if we take in 2 million, we can hit X, Y, Z, um, obviously discounting that because things happen. But I would say that comes with just knowing your business. And then I think especially in the early stages, the partner you work with is vitally important. And so I would be optimizing for what is the best valuation you think you can get to with a high degree of confidence that you think you can deliver what you need to deliver with enough money and runway that you're taking in to do that, but then also who's going to be the person alongside of you that is helping you on that journey and what do they bring to the table and how can they potentially help you to go out and raise that next round in the future. Yeah, yeah. So what are you, if you're looking, let's let's take the, the car, the picture of the car, if you look under the hood, what do you like to see here? You said, you know, the founder having a good grip on the, on the, on the business. What are those things that you're looking for? What are the small things that you're saying? And like, also, what are the metrics and possible indicators that you say, you know what, this is a really good, this is a pretty efficient engine and it can go far. So maybe I can even pay a little premium because maybe it's not 30 worth really 30 X right now, but like I feel or 20 X, whatever it is. Uh, but I feel the team kind of can get there. So what are the metrics that you found are good telltales for for investors and therefore for founders to kind of watch out for? Um, I think that's dependent on stage. So if we're doing pre-seed, that's different than if we're doing seed. So I'll talk to each of those. Um, mm -hmm. On the pre-seed side, if it's you know, a company that's raising maybe a million dollars or less with a friends and family trying to figure it out, but they want one institutional investor as a partner in there. Um, 
the main things we're looking for at that point is how big is the market? So do we believe that this can actually scale to a multi-billion dollar size? Um, as a founder, is there founder product fit? Is there something about the founder that makes them absolutely the right person to start this company? And can you feel that fit and that passion when you're talking to them about the product? And then some level of market validation. So that's not, you know, we needed to have gone in and sold to you know, six or seven companies already. It's definitely not in that level. It's more, hey, we've had conversations with the 20 of the key people in the companies that we think we'd be selling to. Here's what they told us. Here's what they'd want to see. And so we're looking for some level of diligence that they know that they actually have a market and a product that they can sell, even if it's not fully developed. Um, that's on the pre-seed side, and then we'll help you get to what you need on the seed. Um, and then on the seed stage side, it's a little bit farther along. So we'd be looking for at least a couple of early indicators of what that sales cycle is going to look like. Maybe you have pilots that you're working on that are in the market. Maybe you have a handful of paying customers already. Um, I think for us, we're a little bit more focused on acceleration. So how are you looking at growth? What's in the pipeline? You know, are people excited about this? Are they telling other people more so than you know, there's no hard and fast ARR number or something that we're shooting for? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then, you know, in Series A, you're really going for for that repeatable repeatable process and obviously what would you say a series a and like a, a, a pre-seed seed and series a what what's the expectations around revenue um so i'd say on the a side it's probably somewhere close to a million arr ish um i'm gonna put an asterisk in that though because i think one of the things that's interesting about venture is People will give you hard and fast rules all day long, and then next thing you know, like you're going to see a company that has zero revenue, and everybody gets excited, and you're like, "Here's." And a Series A in Boston is maybe different than a Series A in the Valley. Is it different than a Series A in Athens, right? Yeah, exactly. So I think there's there's no hard and fast rule around that, but I would say you're looking for some indicator that there's at least some risk out of the business, so you know what those sales cycles are, you know, you know what the pricing model looks like, you know it your unit economics are going to be, your contribution margin, any of those things. Um, and then I think the, the big thing is acceleration. So where are you at in the growth curve? Like, can can this amount of money truly just be gassed or fuel on that fire and, and help you go? Okay, thank you. Uh, before we go into the questions, and guys, look, please use the Q&A, not, not the chat. Uh, the Q&A would make it much easier for us with the, with the questions. Uh, Anna, like I'm sure you you discussed this with your partners. Where is where is funding going right now? It seems that there's a little bit like uncertainty around. Oh God, the markets. Maybe not everything is just blue sky and going you know up up in the sky. Uh, what do you see? Like I don't know. Do you have any predictions for 2022? What would you what would you say to a founder that thinks about? Well, I wanted to raise in 2022. What maybe to look out for? And is it better to go earlier, later? What do you think? Yeah, um, I think the, the funding environment that we have right now is incredibly founder friendly. And so if there is an option based on where you are with your company and stage, and you know, if, if it would be helpful to you, I would say you know, raise more now while you can, just in case. Um, so I'd, I'd say that. Uh, I actually don't think the funding markets are going to change that dramatically, especially in the near term. Um, but I would also just be cognizant of your underlying company dynamics and you know, what is your runway? Really, like, what does that look like? What are downside scenarios? Um, just focus on building a great business because I think the in this environment, the things that will fall away are the hype, but I think when you have poor business fundamentals that are working, um, I think one of the differences between like this bubble and previous bubbles is this one, if you're selling to large companies, those companies are going to be around, they're going to be paying for the products, your your business is not going to be impacted. And so uh, I, don't, I don't think you're going to see, especially on the SaaS side, a huge decrease in any time soon. We'll see, but... Yeah. yeah, so tech is still strong. There might be a little bubbles up and down. Maybe we're, we're not going to see 
the the crazy crazy valuation people getting I've, I've seen a bunch of, of people getting a little bit more cautious in what they invest and what they're ready to pay but that also means get your fundamentals right right so as everything like we say with eventually in studios just like you know build the engine to for the fuel not get the fuel and then, and then trying to figure out the engine um, I want to I want to jump over to a couple of questions so uh, more that uh, ask as an investor what recommendations would you give an, on sourcing your pipeline of startups while managing relationships with the community um. Oh, so that might, must be an, must be an investor. So <laughs> yeah, that's what I was I was going to ask that. So, meaning, how do I think about sourcing? Um, I think the what do you do to meet to meet companies to so to make it valuable for both sides? What how how can people get you and like what what is your way to to, to be out there? Yeah, uh, well, doing things like this helps. So, thank you for having me today. Awesome um, to have you. <laughs> so, I think I think just. You know, all, all of the, the easy stuff, right? So you had asked about mentoring earlier on, being plugged into certain networks that you're interested in and you think maybe match what you're going to ultimately invest in. Um, I think I'm fortunate that coming from the Boston community back in the day that I have core people that I have stayed close to and are wonderful sources of referral. And so I find, find a handful of people that just seem to be everywhere. I, I actually noticed an example of that. I noticed David Chang is in the, the Slack. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's like eight of him because he seems to be everywhere all the time and know everybody in Boston. So I think finding finding those folks that are just amazing helpers yeah, and yeah. they're going to know who are the people that, that you should talk to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you and David Chang, by the way, just did a, did a, um, a session last week here, a smaller session here. Uh, around fundraising, which was very interesting. Oh, that's great. That's good. Yeah, so it is that David Chang, yeah. Um, Joe Murphy asks, what verticals or themes do you see developing over the next 12 to 18 months? Oh, interesting. Um, or maybe maybe we start as like, what's strong right now? And maybe on top of that, what, what could even get stronger? Or is there a, sub, a couple of themes that you see that, that kind of just are about to develop? Yeah, so this is very broad, but I think anything that is using technology, AI to make things more efficient. So you're seeing as people get more comfortable with remote work, starting to ask the questions, what else can we do that don't require humans being there and in, in the flow? And so I think there's going to be some interesting trends coming out of that, especially in industries that maybe are not ones you would have thought of. So are there things in how you potentially read like diagnostic estuaries? Are there things that are happening in construction that ultimately can take some of the human burden out? And there's going to be a lot of interesting companies built on top of that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Michael uh, asks, uh, are pre-revenue but first generation product wasting their time trying to race? Um, no. I have even invested in a handful of those, so I don't think you're wasting your time. I think the the early stage of that is just more important that you find the right person. So you're trying to find the true evangelist and believer of that product that can help you then get to the revenue stage. But I, I don't think you're wasting your time if you feel like you truly need the money to be able to do whatever it is that you need. We want to for that next stage of the business. So not fundraising yeah. for reason's sake, but like truly it's gonna be the next accelerant for the company. And I wanna I wanna chime in here, like it, it's usually really how can you so not not having or being really pro, pre product means there's a bit of an investor risk here because we don't know how this is all coming out. But the, the, the bit here is how can you de-risk it, right? So if you've done your research right, if you have the right people on board, if you have you know if you're multiple time founder or you have a product market fit what I think uh, that was one of the things that David Chang we got like uh, founders do not spend enough time to actually uh, prepare a slide that says hey and by the way this is all the stuff that I've done for you f to de-risk your bet that this is the right company so of course there are still risks but what are maybe the things that you've done already that could de-risk that uh, we have we have Max um, asking, how should a one million round be labeled after finishing an accelerator uh, program, looking for that money to for go to market? 
hiring expenses uh, mostly. Um, I've heard some investors just skip opportunities when they are labeled uh, when they're labeled or look like uh, out for their standards. So, like, is it important to label it a pre-seed or seed or Series A? And how would you go about if you if you if you raised a million dollars? That's interesting. In the old world, the million dollars would have been the seed round. Uh, in the new world of what we're living in, I think the pre-seed of a million is actually getting to be fairly common. And so I think you can label it either of those things, depending on who's in that round. I think the thing I would look at would be, what is that investor mix? Is it primarily angels? Is it you know, super early stage funds? Is it you know, institutional seed investors that are going a little bit earlier? And depending on what that mix looks like, I think that would indicate what you would call it. And also a little bit of what your what your history is, right? So do you have already a couple of saves or uh, convertible notes? What's your post money? So that, that has that plays it. So you might raise right now a million dollars, but if you raised already a million dollars on something, that might change a little bit the, the story. But I would say if you go after angels and smaller checks, it's probably more or micro micro VCs is probably more of a pre seed. Uh, here in Boston, I would say it would probably go for a pre seed. Yeah, that's at the verge, like you want to do a seed that's probably more like a one and a half, two million, three million, four, two to four, something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'd lean towards calling that pre seed. Good. Uh, we got uh, Royden. Uh, hello to Maine. Um, does Flybridge invest in pre revenue, pre launch companies uh, at the pre seed stage? Um, we do. Uh, given that there's some some validation there. So to your point that you were talking about earlier of you know, what have you done to de-risk that, we like to see that there's some some validation that yes, this can be a real business. But one of our favorite things to do actually is come alongside a founder really early and write the 250, 300K check that then we get in the trenches and help them get to that $2 million or $4 million seed round that ultimately we, we lead. So we've done that with a couple of companies, like there's a company, uh, YAA, that's in the auto space um, based out of DC that we recently did. And then ultimately they raised a really successful seed round. Okay, awesome. Uh, Fadi asks, what are some of your back of the envelope approaches to valuation? Percentage of target ownership, multiples uh, of revenue. So a bunch of metrics that would help people and maybe there's a bandwidth here because it's sometimes uh, tough depending on what market you're in, what margins you have, what stage you're in, and so on. But what are your back of the pack? If you if you see like a first time deal here and you think like, ah, oh, that makes sense. What 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 are those, Anna? Um, the so the back of the envelope math we're doing is could this investment potentially return the fund? And so it's a little bit nebulous because it's based on the company and what we think the opportunity is, but. That would mean we do an Excel spreadsheet that says if we own 10% now, we think they're going to have to raise X number of dollars in the future. We think we're going to get diluted down to you know, 3% by the time all of that is set done. They ultimately exit for you know, 2 or $3 billion, which we think is potential. If they knock it out of the park, then this investment can return $200 million, what? whatever that looks like. Um, and so I think the, if you're looking for the math that you should do alongside of the investor, it's figure out their fund size and then think about size of check that they're writing into your company, potential ownership. And then as you think about scale, what could that look like as far as returns down the road? Are you guys still looking for 20, 30% shares if you're elite in a, in like the, the seed, round, seed round? No, No. so we're, we're we're not really ownership specific um, in the, to that calculation. I mean, if you have a company that's going to ultimately be a fifty billion dollar company, you can own, you know, five percent of that at the seed stage and still end up with massive returns. And so it's a little bit more focused on risk profile and ultimate exit potential of the company than it is. You know, we absolutely have to own X percent. Okay. Okay, okay. I hope uh, and uh, multiples. What are you looking like? SaaS. What would you say is like the common go rate? Um, depends on stage. I mean, let's do a seat. 
speed. Uh, this environment is weird, so I'm going to say anything from five to twenty. Yeah. <laughs> and although I mean, we've seen outliers. Of it. Okay, got it. Thanks for that. Uh, that was Fadi. Um, going to Suyesh. Very useful, Anna. What's your view on how investors are looking at deep tech startups? Is the level of patience in getting uh, these to market changing in today's market? So are people eager to to invest? Um, deep tech. So I do think there's a lot of interesting movement there. Um, I would caution that though if it takes a very specific type of investor. So if you're if you're dealing with something that is a much longer market cycle, like we have an investment in X Factor, that's a company called Venus Aerospace, which is building a hyperjet to get you from San Francisco to Japan in an hour and a half. Um, that's gonna be a very, very, very long road and that fund is set up to do that. And so we could ultimately make that investment, but uh, that's not something probably we would do on the flybridge side just because it's going to take years and years and years for that to, to ever come back to market. So I would just say know your investors. I think there are a lot of people very interested in this and you're seeing new funds pop up every day that are focused there. Um, but I would qualify before you have those conversations. Okay, good one. Thank you. Um, we have um, how do how do oh. Well, let me go through the first one, Michael. Are founders uh, who are not techies uh, and cannot code a red flag for you? No, I mean I'm a I'm a non-technical founder <laughs> two times over, and my my co-founder actually for my first company was non-technical as well. Um, and actually, I think all of the the founders I've invested in so far have also been non-technical. Um, okay. So I don't I don't think that's a red flag at all. I think. If you are not the technical founder, but you're building a very technical business, then you just need to make sure that whoever is alongside of you for that journey is the one that has the chops and can speak to that. Investors are going to want to talk to them, but uh, I'm definitely not scared from business founders. I love them. I think it's I think it's a awesome. Good and I love what you say, Anna, because I'm also a non-technical founder, and I think non-technical founders, you know, can provide so much value. I think if you if you have a good talent of bringing the right people on board, it's always a it's always a team effort. So this is not about just technical founder, non-technical founder. I think both can can play a role. Now, I will, I will flag that though. I was joking with my my co-founder, my first company. We had joked like we need a technical founder because when we go to pitch VC offices back in the day, you had to hook your computer up and like you know do the whole thing with the presentation on the the screen. And for some reason, for us, figuring out how to do that and making it work every time was remarkably hard. And so we were joking that we needed a technical founder just to help us with the presentation setup when we initially came in and pitched. Yeah, nice. Um, it, we're approaching 1245. So there's one one suggestion here. Uh, Anna said that she might have another five minutes or 10 minutes. There's a couple of open questions. So who wants to stay on? Please stay on. We go through those questions. Um, usually we end this with uh, Anna, like how can people get in touch with you um, if they want to reach out? I know that you just joined our VentureLink Connect Slack channel. So that is one I just put here in the chat. Uh, the website, if you go a little scroll a little bit further down uh, on that website, you can actually apply for that Slack channel. We curated, it's 1,100 uh, founders, mentors, investors, uh, mostly Boston and East Coast startups, B2B uh, tech. Um, but what are other ways, Anna, to get in touch with you? Um, so definitely that, and then I dropped my email in the chat. It's Anna at flybridge.com, so I'm pretty easy to find if you want to just drop me a note there as well. Cool. Uh, good stuff. You might have, if you put it into the chat, you might have actually needed to probably address it to everyone. You might have. I did. Put it. I'll put it back in. Yeah. This. Awesome. Cool. Um, so thank you so much for that. For uh, a couple more questions, let's go through the, those quite quickly. Um, Jean Johnny, uh, uh, Jean Johnny was was asking, do you see a product, a mobile app, or su to support people at rehabilitation centers? 
um, where they can group and have activities include their guardians and parents and doctors. Is that something like rehabilitation space? Is that something you would say is is right now hot? Um, I don't know enough about that space specifically, but I would say as an interesting sector that people are looking at hard is kind of anything healthcare enabled in general. And that I think post COVID you're seeing a big focus on how does technology and health intersect. And so that would probably fall into that bucket and something people might be interested in. Okay, nice. And we have Ben. Ben, thanks for joining us. Ben Litauer, great mentor here also in our Slack channel. How much of a, of a fund uh, does Flybridge reserve uh, for follow on and pro rata? Um, so we, it depends on funds. So we have our, so our main seed funds, um, which we don't necessarily have a specific percentage that we're reserving for follow along. It's kind of dependent on fund and what our investments look like, and what we think we're going to need. Um, but we also have an opportunity fund, which was going to be probably around 25 million, um, which is then what we deploy into later stage companies as well. So we invest alongside you on the seed stage and then potentially as you're going out and raising your series C, series D um, opportunity fund would come in there as well. Okay, good. Uh, Daniel was asking, uh, how do you break down risk analysis? So how, how do you actually go about risk and what areas are you more fo focused on when you uh, look at a new company? Are there any rules of thumb that you like to use and kind of what are the things that kind of, or on another way, which are the things that actually de-risk, if we haven't talked about them already, de-risk uh, a potential investment for you? This is actually an exercise that I initially learned from Techstars back in the day. That's been one of the most valuable things throughout my entire career, which is asking the question if this company is to fail, why? And if you fast forward you know, three years from now, what were the things that ultimately played into that decision? And if you can write those down, and then de-risk each of those. So if that's, oh, it could fail because it turns out people aren't willing to pay enough for this product. If you know that, then you need to go out and actually validate the customers will pay for what you're building enough to be able to have unit economics that work. Um, that would be an example, or it's going to fail because you know, maybe the technology to support this just isn't there yet. You'd want to validate that. And so I think as a founder, asking yourself that question because... I'm going to be asking that on the other side of the table and having really good answers to each of those that you've already thought through and have de-risks is helpful. Yeah, I love that. That's that's uh, br bringing it down like in one question of like, you know, why would my company fail? Like, okay, I got everything in place here. That's that's awesome. Uh, Martin is asking if, uh, if uh, you are funding outside of the U.S., uh, for example, Ireland. Um, I have not done anything in Ireland. We have, so I personally have investments in London, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, okay. as, a, as a fund, we do quite a bit in Korea, Latam, etc. So would be something that we would look at. We're definitely open to international. So, so Ireland doesn't mean this is a no? Um. Um, no, I, I'm not familiar enough with the rules and regulations and what we'd have to do. There, so I don't, I don't know the market specifically, but I guess blanket statement, no, we would just want to dig in and see. Got it. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Jean, Jean, Jean again. We have developed an Airbnb similar, uh, similar app for phishing charters. Uh, and with the pandemic, we just couldn't go forward with customer acquisition. Do you think that we should go forward with it now? Oh, interesting. Um, maybe. I think, I think the question to ask is if it was truly the pandemic and customer acquisition that made that business hard or if there was some other reason. But if it is just the generalized conditions of people couldn't travel and that, that hurt you, I would be willing to give it a shot. Um, yeah. And maybe to, to chime in here, like uh, for me, that would also be like, you know, do, do the homework of reach out to a bunch of people, see if there's interest, maybe, you know, set up a landing page and do a bunch of, uh, of Google key, keywords and, and see whether there is some appetite for that again. Uh, uh, and then that might inform data, might inform your decision whether you want to keep, keep going with it or not. Um, and uh, Sindhu asked, uh, there seems to be a lot of interest around raising safe notes, both from founders and VCs. 
what are your thoughts on raising SAFE? The SAFE. Um, I think SAFEs have a great place in the market in that they're easy, it's fast, it helps you get that round done. I would caution though that if you're doing the SAFE notes with caps, I think the one the one challenge of that is that there's no Fed protection as a founder because you're not you're not pricing the company. So if you're saying you have a a safe net that maybe if all goes well, it's a cap, you're selling 20% of the company, that's great. Uh, if something was to happen and all of a sudden you couldn't get the valuation up to that cap or over, then there's some chance that the round comes in underneath that and you end up selling a lot more than what you thought you could. So I think there's, they're a great vehicle, especially super early on. Um, but I would just have the cautionary tale of, especially as your company gets bigger and the amount of money that you're taking in on the safe gets bigger. I think there's times for price rounds and there's reasons for price rounds and I wouldn't be scared of actually pricing it. Yeah. I mean, just two things from my side, what I've, I've seen actually whole funding rounds being derailed because somebody put out a uncapped safe and just didn't get it ever done because people say like, why would I do this? Oh, yeah. I, on the other hand, I've, I've seen companies like that go through the roof and have just like this momentum and they can just say everything and people throw, but that is like the top 0.1 or 1%. Um, and the other thing is like saves are great. I love them. They're really in a way founder friendly and easy to do, but just be sure that you don't do five rounds of saves over and over and over again. That kind of erodes a little bit the, the trust that you actually can raise on a priced round. And uh, last question here, Anna, thanks so much for making the time. Uh, Joe Murphy, um, you mentioned healthcare interest. Are you looking at workforce augmentation extenders as heavy pressure on hiring and retaining currently? I think serious illness seems ripe for new solutions here. Can you comment? I don't know if you have any, any feedback on um, um, serious illness and workforce augmentation. Um, I have not thought about that specifically, but you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the healthcare market in general and technology and how it interfaces potentially in the current environment with the workforce. And so it's, it's an interesting question. It's going to be something that we're faced with for a long time. So if you're working on something in space, hard to know until I see it, but maybe it's interesting. So. Awesome. Cool, good stuff. Anna, thank you so much for your time. Uh, uh, awesome and timely answers to the question, like, are we in a bubble? What to expect? How should I uh, treat this as a founder? Uh, thanks so much for, you, for your insights. Very valuable. I took, I took a bunch of uh, things away here uh, that uh, I even wrote, wrote down here, and I, I learned a bunch. So hopefully uh, all the rest, but that was a really lively discussion. Thank you so much for your time and for your effort. Hope to see you soon again, possibly in person. Yes, let's do it. That's great. Okay, Thanks for having me. Thanks, Anna. Have a good one. Thank you. You too.